He wanted to impeach God. And God permitted him to develop an army. He gave him time to develop his rebellion. And he had over one third of the angels on his side. But there was going to be a showdown. You see, it's not a sin to be at war. You see, the Bible says, and there was war in heaven. You can't help your enemies. See, you're going to have enemies when you serve God, when you are on the straight and narrow path. Satan is going to rise up against you. That's why Jesus told his disciples before he left this earth, he said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. So expect tribulation. But be of good cheer. Tribulation does not have to make you die. And tribulation cannot take you down. Because the Bible says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. The Bible says, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and its glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy shall come in like a flood. The Spirit of God, the omnipotent Spirit of God will lift up a standard sufficient to hold the enemy at bay, to hold him in check. So that all things will work together for the good, for those who love the Lord, and for those who are the cause, according to his purpose, so the Christian can rejoice in tribulation. Because he knows that there is no temptation taken unto him that such as is common to man, but God is faithful. He will not allow the devil to tempt you beyond your ability to resist him. And see, the last generation, they're going to learn how to fight the devil, how to win, how to overcome the mightiest rebel in the universe. We think we're having resistance in the political realm, and we are. God is able to orchestrate everything. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and for those who are the called according to his purpose. And when you believe that, when you put God first, everything that happens to you will happen for your good and his glory. He's going to bring you closer to him. We are in the, a furnace of affliction. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. You're being purified. You're being cleansed. You're being prepared for eternity. Our whole message is based on being cleansed. Under 2,300 days, then says the sanctuary, then shall God's people be cleansed. Our whole message is based on the purifying process. So I rejoice when I go through trials. I rejoice all the time. Because <laughs> you know, I know when the devil comes after me, he's trying to destroy me. And see, I just get stronger. You see, trouble shakes you. Either it settles you in or shakes you out. You either get stronger or you get weaker when trials come. And the saints, as they travel up the narrow road, they will get stronger and stronger and stronger and more determined till they are sealed. They have settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. 
Don't you want to reach that point? You can't do it on your own. You see, with men it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. We've got to take God at his word. God is not a man that he should lie. God doesn't have to lie or exaggerate to get you to follow him. He tells the straight truth. The problem is, the Bible says the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. People don't even want to hear the truth anymore. When you speak the truth, they think you're lying because their minds have been twisted. The Bible says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. They put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They put light for darkness and darkness for light. That's the mindset of the minds of men and women today. They love sin. They are sin-loving multitudes. And when you hold up the truth, the world is at war with you. That's why they put Jesus on the cross. Let's get to the message. <laughs> the title of this message is Holiness and the Sermon on the Mount. Now what I love, in fact, let's pray. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we open your word, as we prepare this message, we pray for the unction of the Holy Spirit. We ask for your guidance, your counsel, your power, your wisdom. Hear our prayer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you imagine living in a time when Jesus walked the earth? A man that was approved of God, who went about doing good, who never sinned. Not even by a thought did Christ yield to the power of temptation. He was able to please God at every step, even as a child. He understood his mission and his calling. And he told his parents, how is it that you're looking for me? At the age of 12, why is it that you are looking for me? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? I must do his will. When we become aware of who we are, we're going to have that same response. We've got to be about our father's business. And when you take care of God's business, he's going to take care of yours. Good to see Sister Desiree, Sister Steele, and her little children. They're not little anymore. <laughs> Amen. They have been a joy to my heart for years. Good to see my wife here today. The mighty teacher from Oakwood Elementary School. We're thankful for her ministry and her lifestyle. And all of you know her. Most of you know her. You don't know me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. She must increase, I must decrease. <laughs> but it's good to be in the presence of the Lord. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up to the mountain. You see, Christ was so attractive he was so powerful that he didn't have any media. He didn't have the internet. He didn't have billboards. He didn't have all the things we have today to get word out. But he was so powerful. And so uh, he met the needs of people that they came by the multitudes. They came by the droves. They came by hundreds and thousands to hear his word. You see. Let's go to Matthew 4.24. Matthew 4.24. This is why a lot of people came to hear Jesus. Matthew 24. Matthew 4, verse 24. <clears throat> in fact, verse 23 says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, 
See, Jesus did not just lecture. He preached. He taught the word of God. And when they were finished, when they finished, listen to Jesus, the Bible says, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And see, not only did Jesus preach, but he had a full gospel, a four-dimensional gospel. He went about healing all manner of sickness, Verse 23, all manner of disease among the people. Can you imagine someone with the ability to cure every single disease? See, they don't teach that in any medical school. Jesus cured all diseases, physical diseases, mental diseases, social diseases. He was a fixer. He fixed the problems that the devil caused in the Garden of Eden when man decided to sin. Jesus was able to reverse all the works of the devil all right there on the spot. Verse 24 says, And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all the sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those which had the palsy, and he healed them. You see, I was in prayer this morning, and I was praying about a certain situation about healing, and my mind went to, I asked God the question, why do you seem not to hear prayer for healing? Because I'm praying about certain things. And it seems like my prayers are not being heard. And it seems like there's a delay in prayer. Because God doesn't move when we want him to move. You see, his thoughts are not our thoughts. But uh, the Holy Ghost told me that the Lord's hand is not shorted, that he cannot save. God still has the same power to heal everyone instantaneously if it's his will. His ears are not shortened that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So what we need to do is to purify ourselves, confess our faults, confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There must be nothing between our souls and our Savior. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. God knows our hearts. We can't fool God. He looks beyond what we what we appear to be, he looks exactly at our hearts and he can read us like an open book. We can't hide from God, so we might as well get honest and say, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. When we come to God just as we are, he's able to deal with that. You see, the Pharisees, they felt they were righteous and holy because of what they did. They tried to make it to heaven by their own works. But once we learn that we can't do it on our own and that we all fall short of the glory of God, we lean upon him, we call upon him, he is a savior. Gabriel said, name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And when you come to Jesus, he's going to give you the power that will supersede the power of sin in your own life. His grace is sufficient. And that happened 6,000 years ago when man sinned. Christ came down in the Garden of Eden. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise it's healed. So we have grace at the Garden of Eden to compensate for our weaknesses and our sins, even the accumulated sins of 6,000 years. God will give you more grace when you have more problems. The Bible says, he giveth more grace where sin abound. 
Grace did much more about. So the more problems you have, the more grace and the more power that is available to you. Brother White says we can, through the exercise of prayer and faith, call to our side a retinue of holy angels that will guard us from every corrupting influence. God will empty heaven of angels. God will send every angel out of heaven to aid such a one rather than to allow him to be overcome. Nothing is apparently more helpless yet really more invincible than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly upon the merits of the Savior. That's what happened to Elijah when he was praying for rain. There was a famine for three and a half years, and Elijah had to pray, and he prayed once, and nothing happened. He prayed twice, nothing happened. He prayed three times. He sent his servant to see a sign whether or not his prayer was answered. No, nothing happened. And Ellen White says, when, Ella, when Elijah felt that he was nothing, and God was everything. You see, Elijah was emptying himself of himself in that prayer. He persevered. He endured. He continued to press his petition to the throne of God. He said, Lord, let there be rain. Please send rain. And when Elijah got to the point where he was nothing and God was everything, the servant came back with the answer, I see a cloud like the half a side of a man's hand and it's coming. And Elijah knew that was a sign that God had answered his prayer. Don't give up, you see. So God says, we let go the arm too soon. Learn to stay on your knees. Learn to lock up with God. Make prayer a priority. Believe in his word. Trust in him. Give him the glory. Because God's promises stand back. His character stands back of every promise. Not a man that he should lie. He's going to tell you the truth. Because that's what he is, the truth. All right, Matthew 4, 25. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. So we have all these multitudes following Jesus. Matthew 5, verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was sat down, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. He began to tell people the qualifications for going to heaven. You see, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to go to heaven. You're going to have to have a character. You're going to have to be refined. You're going to have to be developed. You're going to have to get to the point where you are reflecting the very character of God. Matthew 5, verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So how do you feel today? You see, do you feel poor in spirit? Do you recognize, are you acknowledging your weakness, your frailty, your fault, faults? How in many cases it is your fault that you're sick anyway. You see, sin is a, or sickness is a result of sin. When we acknowledge our sins, Lord, it's me. You see, like David prayed in Psalm 51, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. David acknowledged his sins. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and sin did my mother conceive me. David acknowledged his weakness, his need of a savior, his need of a power out of and beyond himself. And whenever you lean on God, he's not going to let you fall. You see, he's going to hold you up. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That mourning is a godly sorrow for sin. 
Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. My heart is broken. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, we live in an age where meekness is considered uh, not only weakness, but being meek is hated and laughed at and ridiculed. But Jesus said, if you're going to make it to heaven, you're going to have to be meek. He said, learn of me, for I am meek. They couldn't understand Jesus because of his character. He's a great God, yet he was so humble, he did not take the glory to himself. Yes, he endured. Blessed are they which you hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All them that live godly, when you become godlike in character, the devil's going to really get stirred up. And he's going to send people to take your life. And when you become, when you come face to face with death, that's really the acid test. I saw the news the other day how this man came to church and he had a gun and he pointed it right at the pastor and he was tending to take that pastor out. That pastor had some guardian angels around him and the gun jammed. You see, Satan can't take you out unless it's God's will. <laughs> the gun jammed and then the deacon took care of the man. But God can protect you even in a situation we can't move fast enough to dodge bullets like they do on television. But the angels can lift up a standard. The Bible says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. God covers us with the covering of the Almighty. He's going to cover all of his children to protect them through the time of trouble. Despite the fact that they're going to have all these drones and these laser-guided bullets, heat-seeking missiles directed at us. God's power supersedes their power and no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise up against you, don't be afraid of people when they talk about you. That's what they're supposed to do. They can't talk about Jesus because they don't know him. So they talk about you. They're trying to shake you up. Don't pay attention to what they say. Pay attention to what God says. God will say, if you endure, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Try to please God. Like Jesus. Jesus had a lot of enemies, but he said, the Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. If Jesus did it, if Enoch did it, you and I can do it today. Despite Satan's temptations and his snares and his tricks and his power to deceive, we don't have to be overcome by the devil. Let's turn to Matthew 24. And his, snares, uh, and his tricks zero in on the closing thoughts of this message. Matthew chapter 24. The disciples came to Jesus. You see, Jesus was on his way out of the temple. You see, Matthew 24, 1, when Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Jesus was leaving the temple, but the disciples came to him to show him the beauties of the temple. Come back and see this beautiful building. Christ was on his way out, but they said, look, come see this beautiful building. It's been fixed up. It's been renovated. It's been made to look like new. Look at this beautiful building. It's been renovated. It's been made to look like new. Look at this beautiful building. One day, this building is going to be leveled. 
one day, this building Nobody is going to be leveled to because the prophecy said Jerusalem is going to stand forever. So when Jesus said that, it was a radical statement, you see. And the disciples Jesus said, that, well, privately, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the us, sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Well, they wanted to know. After Christ made that statement that the end is near, uh, Christ is about ready to come, or the destruction of Jerusalem is imminent, Tell us, when shall all these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Tell us, when shall all these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Tell us, when shall all these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? In the political arena, certain people say certain things, they lie, and people believe a lie. I'm amazed at how people are believing and following people that are not following God, but the devil has worked uh, his wonders on people's minds, and people are not thinking straight. I'm amazed at how people are believing and following people that are not following God, but the devil has worked uh, his wonders on people's minds, and people are not thinking straight. The political leader. It's going to be a sad thing when Christ comes. When the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he's going to put down all rule. And those who stand with those that are not standing with God are going to be in trouble. They're going to be the ones that are going to run to the rocks and mountains saying, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that's going to put down all And from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come. Trouble. They're going to be the ones that are going to run to the rocks and mountains saying, Fall on us. Matthew 24 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall receive the you. The great and shall have wars and rumors of wars. Jesus will be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. We are having that today. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in many places. And these are the beginning of sorrows. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted. You see, they're going to attack you. See. And they're going to kill you. They're going to hate you. And it's not any fun to be under the scourge of someone's hatred. But you're going to be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And, he is, and then men shall many be offended and they shall betray one another and hate one another. See, this is a succession of decline. Moral deprivation and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. This is an orchestrated plan of the enemy to ensnare the world. And because of iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold. We didn't say everybody, but many. But he that shall endure until the end same shall be saved. So we're living in an age where people have no love. The love of many have waxed cold. But God's going to lift up a standard. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. So the gospel will go out with clarity and power to the whole world and the people will respond. The world will have the world will have a witness, a living witness of the glory of God. God's going to pour out his spirit upon his saints, his sanctified ones. They're going to reflect his image fully. They're going to be empowered like they were empowered on the day of Pentecost. And we're going to see thousands of people converted in a day. Miracles are going to be wrought. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders will follow the believer. Brothers and sisters, we can get this power now. 
we lock up with God like we should. God's going to come. We're going to send that power down and close it. The Bible asks a few questions. Uh, let's turn to Isaiah 33. The Bible asks the questions, three questions in the Bible. Uh, Isaiah 33 talks about who will stand. Isaiah 33, who will make it in the church? Isaiah 33, 14 says, the sinners in Zion are afraid. So folk in the church, they're going to be afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites, those who say one thing and do another. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Who will make it to heaven? That's what I want to know, because I want to be among one of those that will make it to heaven. The Bible says, he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly and despiseth the gain of the oppressions, he that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, he that stopped his ears from see, hearing of blood, who that shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. This person, these individuals, are going to walk with God and their place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. And I'm going to provide for these people even in the time of trouble. Bread shall be given unto him. His waters shall be sure. Let's go to Revelation chapter 5. The other question about who. Revelation 5. You see. John the apocalyptic messenger for these last days. Revelation chapter 5. The Bible says, Revelation 5, verse 1 says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? The divine challenge. And no man, nobody was able to step up and say, I'm worthy. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book and to look thereof. And John wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. You see, if nobody opened the book, nobody's prayers would be answered. Nobody would have power. Nobody would be safe. If nobody stepped up to the plate and opened up that book, we would all be lost. So that's why John wept, because nobody was found worthy to open the book. And as John wept, you see, one of the elders said to him, Weep not, John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed. He overcame the devil. You see, devil, the devil couldn't get everybody. The lamb uh, of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed. He overcame the devil. He was able to say, the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. And I beheld, lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. Christ was slain with seven horns. He had omnipotent power, seven eyes. He had supernatural intelligence and seven spirits, the Holy Ghost. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of God. Right hand of him that sat on the throne and he had taken the book. When he had taken the book, the 24 elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped every one of them with harps and golden vows full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now your prayers can be answered as the organist plays something softly, the pianist. Something's going to happen, you see. And they sung a new song. You see, they had an advocate in heaven now. Somebody in heaven that looks like me, that can represent me, that will plead my cause. Someone that is touched with the feelings of my infirmities. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Somebody is there, my elder brother. 
my savior, my Lord, my master. He's up in heaven and he's pleading my cause. He's pleading his blood. Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Now your prayers can be answered because of the life of Jesus and his blood. The merits of his blood, the Bible says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death. Once we understand the power of the blood, The blood will never lose its power. When I see the blood, the Bible says in the book of Exodus, I'm going to pass over that house. The angel of death could not come near those that had the blood on their posts. You see, we need God's blood. We need his seal. We need his power. We need victory over sin. God will not lower the standard. There is no excuse for sin. We've got to put away all of our sin. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. God is able. What man can't do, God can. We've got to look beyond the human into the divine. God will give you supernatural power. As many as received him, them gave me power to become the sons of God. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every nation and kindred and tongue and people. The whole world has the ability to hear salvation and accept it. And hath made us unto our God's kings and priests, and we shall reign... Earth. You and I are future kings and queens and priests. We are to live one day in the very presence of God. He's preparing you now for heaven, for eternity. Time is short. Time is running out. Christ is at the door. Judgment begins at the house of God first. When probation closes, when your probation closes, where will you stand? As the heads about and eyes are closed, I wonder, is there one who would say, Lord, I, if my probation closed right now, I know there's some things in my life that I have not yet got together. Some things are not under the blood, you see. But Lord, right now, I want to make it right. I want to get to the point now before I leave this room that uh, there is nothing between my soul and my Savior. Lord, work on my heart. Take away my sins. Change me. Transform me. Turn me into a new creature. Is there anything today that would say, Lord, I want to get right with God? I'm not ready now, but I want to be. I see two hands went up. Is there another? Do I want your transforming power? I recognize I'm not ready for the close of my probation, which could happen any time. A tornado could come through town and tear this whole church up and kill everybody here. But thank God for the blood of Jesus. I was at my house the other day, and uh, I don't know if I shared this story here. And a storm came in South Charleston, West Virginia. It just ripped all around where I was staying. I, I live right next to the church. And I didn't know if I was going to live or die, but I just prayed and trusted in God and went back to eat my granola. Because I know that God can protect me. I know that no weapon in this form against me shall prosper. I know God will watch over me. Like the disciples when they were in that boat and the storm came and they were afraid. But Jesus was not afraid because he understood God's keeping power. He knew it was not his time to go. So he was able to get out of that boat and walk on water. God can do it all, you see. When you yield yourself to him, he will work wonders through you. 
And they will say, what matter of man is this? What matter of woman is this? What matter of child is this? That the winds and the waves obey him. Christ is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, let us pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful for what you are able to do. We're thankful that you so loved us that you gave us Jesus. That whoever believes on him, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. We call upon you right now. Lord, save us. Give us victory over all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to do evil. Save us from ourselves. Save us from sin. Save us from one another. Save us from sinners. Save us from Satan. For Satan has been defeated. Sin shall not have dominion over us. Save us from our sins. And keep us till we meet again. Bless this church. Bless this ministry. Bring many a soul to come to hear the living word of God. Hear our prayer we pray. In Jesus name. Amen.